Hi everyone, this is Mr. Zhang, and today we'll be going over the math homework for class P today, and this is for session U1. All right, for question number one, if five times parentheses x minus two is equal to 30, what is the value of x? So here you have one equation and one variable, which means you can solve for x. What you want to do is you want to use inverse operations. And what do you do to one side? You got to do to the other side to get x by itself. So in order to uh, isolate x, the first thing you're going to have to do is divide by 5 because there's an invisible multiplication sign there between the 5 and the parentheses. So the opposite of multiplying is divide. So you're going to have to divide by 5 on both sides. And that's going to cancel out the times 5 on the left. And on the left side, you'll be left with x minus 2. Now on the right side, you also divide by 5. And when you do 30 divided by 5, you get 6. So once you divide by 5 on both sides, the equation looks a lot simpler. You have x, this variable is a missing number, minus 2 is equal to 6. In the last step, you're going to have to add 2 to both sides, which is the opposite of subtracting by 2. And that will give you 6 plus 2, which is 8 for x. And that's going to be choice C. Now what you can do is you can always check your work. And when you check uh, that x is equal to 8, you would have to do a substitution. Everywhere you see the variable x, you're going to have to substitute uh, x equals 8 uh, to check your work. So instead of 5 times uh, x minus 2, it'll be 5 times 8 minus 2. And you want to see if that's equal to 30. So now you just have to uh, use the order of operations. In the forward direction, you have to do the parentheses first. So that's minus. So 8 minus 2 is going to be 6. So then you have 5 times 6 is, in fact, equal to 30. So everything does check out. So just to summarize for question number 1, to solve for x, here you have to use inverse operations. And whatever you do to one side, you got to do to the other side. And uh, you'll have x isolated on one side. Uh, for the answer of C. All right, next for question number two, Jean has three pairs of jeans and five t-shirts. How many different combinations of shirts and jeans uh, does he have? So the keyword here is combinations. And for this particular problem, uh, this is a counting principle question for tree diagram. So you can solve this using the counting principle, which is just a shortcut of the uh, tree diagram question. So uh, to do this question uh, using the tree diagram, which is a more classic uh, example, you have you know your start, and you basically pick a pair of genes. So you have three options there. You can pick gene number one, gene two, or gene three. And either of them are fine. Now, after you pick a pair of jeans, then you have to pick a t-shirt. And within each of these branches, you branch out five more times. Because you have t-shirt number one, t-shirt number two, t-shirt number three, t-shirt number four, and t-shirt number five. And same thing for the second branch. You have t1, t2, t3, t4, and t5. And same thing for the third pair of jeans. Right. And then to figure out how many combinations you have, you just add up all the branches. And here you have 5 plus 5 plus 5, or 15 total. So the answer is going to be choice D. Now, that's a lot of work. Uh, the shortcut here is by using what's called the counting principle. And the counting principle, you just have to set up uh, blanks to represent each option. So each uh, article of clothing here. So in the first blank, you have genes. And because there are no restrictions, you have three options for genes. You put a number three uh, in this uh, blank here. So this three represents the number of genes that you have, the number of genes you can choose from. Then for the next blank, that's for the shirt. And you have five shirts. So you put a five in the second blank because you have five options to choose from. Now, because there are no restrictions, you always want to multiply here 
3 times 5, and that will be equal to 15 total combinations. A norm, sometimes there are restrictions, and you have to take care of those first. So restrictions like, oh, I can't you know, pair up this pair of uh, you know, jeans with this color t-shirt or whatever. So just be wary of these restrictions. But in this case, there are no restrictions, so you just have 15 total uh, combos. You can either use a tree diagram, it's a more classic approach, or uh, the counter principle as a shortcut. All right, next for question number three, uh, the statement says the difference between Q and R is equal to the product of A and the square of the sum of B and C. So the following is an expression for the statement above. So here, what you have to do is you have to turn the word sentence into a number sentence. So just look at a couple of keywords here. Difference is your first keyword. That means subtract. So you're going to be subtracting Q and R. So it'll be something Q minus R. And now this is equal to. Equal to, of course, means equal sign. So this difference is equal to the next keyword is product. Product means multiply. And you're going to be multiplying two things. A times, now this part is a square of the sum of B and C. So this is a complex expression. You're going to be squaring, raising something to the second power. That's what uh, square means. And you'll be squaring a sum, which means add addition of uh, B and C. So we'll be doing A times, in parentheses, B plus C first, before you do the exponent. Because uh, normally you do the exponent first, and then you add or subtract, according to your order of operations. But here, because you're squaring the sum of B and C, you have to put parentheses around B and C first. So just go to all the choices and see which one uh, looks, like, looks like this, and it's choice B. Now, they had a couple extra parentheses here using these uh, brackets, but you actually don't need the brackets there. Uh, you can put them if you want. They are optional, but you don't need them uh, because you always do the exponent first anyway. All right, so the answer is uh, choice B. You just have to turn the word sentence into a number sentence. Uh, just pay attention to the keywords like difference, which is subtract, uh, equal to means equal sign, product is multiply, square is second power, and sum is add. Okay, for question number four, you have this diagram uh, figured out on a scale, so you can assume the lengths are the proper uh, are properly drawn here. Now, if rectangle ABCD above has a length of five and a height of three, what is the product? Of the lengths of the diagonals AC and BD. All right, so what you want to find is uh, the diagonals, the two diagonals here, which are the same. The diagonals for a rectangle are always equal. You want to take these two diagonals and you want to multiply them with one another. Now, to find the diagonals, uh, you're going to have to use something called Pythagorean theorem because a diagonal splits a rectangle into two right triangles. So that's just a fact here. And that's because for a rectangle, all sides are, or excuse me, all angles are equal to 90 degrees. So we're going to be using this fact that the diagonals split a rectangle into two right triangles. And specifically, if you look at triangle ABC, this is a right triangle because angle ABC is a right angle, it's part of the rectangle. So once you have a right triangle, you can use Pythagorean theorem. And Pythagorean theorem works for all right triangles. And it states that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So the two legs the sum of the two legs squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. And we only need to do this once because both of the uh, right, the diagonals are equal to one another. 
So in this case, when we have this triangle, uh, two, two legs A and B are three and five, and you're looking for C. So that means that C squared is going to be equal to uh, three squared plus five squared, the sum of the two legs squared. This three and this five. Now, when you solve for C squared, you'll get that three squared is equal to nine, uh, five squared is 25. And when you add nine to 25, you get C squared is equal to 34. Normally, you would take the square root to find what the diagonal is, but here we don't actually need to know about the diagonals. We just want the product of the diagonals. So the diagonals are C. In this case, it's just C. The other diagonal is also going to be C. And what we're really looking for is actually right here, C squared. C is equal to the square root of 34, but when you take C times C, that's equal to C squared. We'll just square the diagonals, and that's just equal to 34. So the same equation here. So that's why the answer is E. We actually don't need to find the diagonal, but you can if you want. It's just a square root of 34, just the inverse of you know, squaring. Uh, and when you multiply the square root of 34 times the square root of 34, the square roots cancel out. And you just get 34. So that's why the answer is C. So here, the key was just Pythagorean theorem, which always works for all right triangles. And it's just A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. All right, next for question number five. If A over 4 is equal to 3A over 6Y, then what is the value of Y? So here, when you have a fraction equal to another fraction, you have a proportion. A proportion is just two equivalent fractions. Now, when you have two equivalent fractions, uh, you can cross multiply because the products will be equal. And that's how you generally solve proportions if there are variables in it. So when you cross multiply, you have on the left side, you have A times 6y and on the right side here you have 3 uh, or 4 times 3a now i've just combined like terms uh, on the left side you don't have any like terms but generally put the coefficient uh, the 6 in front so on the left side just 6ay and on the right side is equal to 4 times 3 which will give you a coefficient of 12a now a shows up in both and we have to actually assume that a is not equal to zero. That should have been stated in the problem, but it's not. You have to assume a is not equal to zero because if a is equal to zero and you you know divide by a, you could be dividing by zero, which can't happen. So uh, this problem should have stated a is not equal to zero. Uh, anyway, so if you divide both sides by a, that will cancel out the variable a on both sides. So that means that 6y the leftovers on the left side must be equal to 12. And to solve for that, you just divide by 6 again because that's the inverse of multiplying. Remember, there are hidden multiplication symbols there. So you know that y has to be equal to 2. And that's what we say. Again, be careful with number 5. Uh, the key was just using a proportion and cross-multiplying. But uh, this question should have stated that a is not equal to 0 so that you don't accidentally divide by 0. Uh, if that's the case, then there technically would be no answer. Because if a is equal to zero, y could be equal to anything. All right, next for question number six, uh, here you have this setup with a whole bunch of lines. Again, figure is not drawn to scale. So in the figure above, lines uh, x and y are parallel. Now, if D is equal to 70 degrees, what is the value of A plus B plus C plus D? All right, so here we're given that D is equal to 70 degrees. And it seems like we're missing a whole bunch of angles. And, you know, we can't really figure out what they are, but it turns out we can because we're told in the problem that X and Y are parallel. That piece of information is really significant. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to... Draw the symbol for parallel, which are those uh, two arrows going in the same direction. It tells me that X and Y are parallel, and they will never meet. So 
So they're never going to touch, they're never going to meet. They're going the same direction uh, forever. Now, when you have a pair of parallel lines and you have something cutting through it called a transversal, this is your classic geometric setup uh, for a whole bunch of corresponding angles, alternate interior angles, opposite angles. They're all equal. So you have a whole bunch of equivalent angles here. Specifically, angle D and angle C are the same. So angle C is equal to angle D because these two are called corresponding angles. And corresponding angles are congruent. Uh, specifically, form, if you have a pair of parallel lines and you have a line cutting through it, Uh, you can kind of imagine uh, a letter F here. So if you have this setup, you have equal angles. So angle C is also equal to 70 degrees. Now, once you know that angle C is equal to 70 degrees, you can actually tell that angle A is also equal to 70 degrees. That's because angle C and angle A, congruent to angle C, uh, and that's because these two are opposite or vertical angles. And these opposite or vertical angles are congruent. So this forms if you have just an X formation. Then the angle on the top is equal to the angle on the bottom. You can mark that up. So here we have angle A and angle C, both equal to 70 degrees. Now just one more angle is remaining, and that's angle B. And if you look at angle B and how it's positioned, uh, angle A and angle B actually make a straight line. Here it's line X. And we have two angles that make up a straight line. They add up to 180 degrees. And this is called supplementary. So A and B are supplementary. They add up to 180 degrees. Now you know that A is equal to 70. You can replace A with 70. So you know that 70 plus B is equal to 180. Then use inverse operation. Subtract 70 on both sides. And you get that angle B has to be equal to 110. And that's because they were supplementary. So once you figure out all these angles, again, just using opposite or vertical angles, uh, supplementary angles, and also corresponding angles, and that's because two lines are parallel, you can now add everything up. A plus B plus C plus D is equal to 70 plus 110 plus 70 plus 70. So that's going to be 210 plus uh, 110, which is equal to 320 degrees. And that's choice D. Now, the other way to do this is if you know that A and B were parallel, I'm sorry, uh, A and B are supplementary, they add it to 180. And you know that angle C is equal to 70, you have the answer right there. You could just do 70 plus 70 plus this 180. And you'll get uh, choice D. But again, uh, this is the classic setup. If you have two parallel lines and you have a transversal, a line that's not parallel and cutting through it, uh, you have a whole bunch of these angles that are congruent. So uh, be on the lookout for these angles. All right, next for number seven, what is the slope of a line that passes through uh, three comma seven and negative one comma negative two? So here the keyword is slope. And the slope represents uh, the steepness of a line. And it's represented by the letter M. And you can think of this as rise over run. So a ratio of how far it goes up divided by how far it goes left to right. Or uh, change in Y over change in X this is a Greek letter delta, which means change. And since we have points here, you can actually use the more important version uh, of this formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which basically means you subtract the y-coordinates 
and then you subtract the x coordinates, and then you divide those two numbers. And that's how you get the slope, this ratio of rise over run. All right, so we have the two points here, which are three comma seven and negative one comma negative two. So if you just substitute in for slope, this is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So one thing to keep in mind is that you have to keep the same direction. So for example, if you do seven minus negative two, it's going like left to right for the arrow. You have to also do three minus negative one. Okay, we're also going to the right uh, in terms of this arrow. Okay, you, you can't do negative one minus three for whatever reason here. So just be careful of that. So either way, uh, when you do seven minus negative two, the reason I chose this direction is so that uh, the numbers are positive. Seven minus negative two, the negative naturally cancel and you got positive nine. In the numerator and denominator, three minus negative one is positive four. And that's choice A. So to summarize uh, this question, the key is to use a definition of slope, which is the steepness of the line. Uh, you can think of slope as rise or run, change of y over change in x, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And that uh, last form is the one that we're going to be using here to solve for the slope as a ratio of how much this line goes up divided by how much it goes to the left or right. All right, and here is the summary for this page. All right, next for question number eight, the total cost C in dollars of producing A units of a certain product is given by the function C of A is equal to 32A minus parentheses 13A plus B, where B is a constant. Now, if 450 units were produced for a cost of $75,000, what is the value of B? So here the keyword is function, and a function is just an input output machine. Now, what this means is that you put in some number, A in this case, and this function here is this rule that you would do to A, this input, and then you'll get an output. And the output here is the total cost. So you put in A, which is the units of the product, so how many things you're making, uh, into this function called C, into this uh, machine, and then you'll get an output uh, called C of A, which is the dollars. And C specifically is a cost uh, in dollars. So here you just have to substitute in with uh, the units given. For example, 450 units corresponds with A. And the output here is 75,000. So again, the input is A, the output uh, the input is A, which is 450. The output is $75,000. So that means that you'll just have to substitute in where the output, 750,000, or sorry, 75,000, is equal to uh, the input, which is 32. Instead of A, you're going to replace A with 450. So you have 32 times 450 instead of A, and now we're subtracting in parentheses 13A, or 13 times 450, plus B. And that will give you 75,000. So this is the equation that you are trying to solve. And now we can simplify this uh, after substituting in. Again, what we did was we substituted in 450 instead of A, uh, in for A, I'd say. And when you do 32 times 450, 
Uh, here you can actually use a calculator because uh, you probably need a calculator for this section. So 450 times 72 is 14,400. Now you're subtracting uh, 13 times 450, which is 5,850 uh, plus B. And this is equal to 7,500 or 75,000. All right, and now uh, to solve for B, I'll just have to use inverse operations. And remember, whatever you do to one side, you gotta do to the other side. So the first thing to do is subtract 14,400 from both sides. So we have 75,000 minus uh, 14,400. That's gonna give you 60,600 is equal to negative uh, 5850 plus B. So now because you have a negative in front of a parenthesis, this is like negative one times this parenthesis, and you can divide both sides by negative one to cancel that out, to cancel out that negative sign. So you'll end up with negative 60, uh, 1,600 is equal to 5,850 plus B. Now the last step, you have to subtract 5,850 to cancel that out. So B will be equal to 60,600 minus 5,850. I'm oh, sorry, negative uh, 60,600. Uh, minus 5850. So we have six, 60,600. Uh, you'll have a total of B, which is equal to negative 66,450. Just be careful with the negative signs. And that's choice E. So that means that this function, this input output machine, uh, is C of A is equal to 32A minus parentheses 13 times a minus uh, when you're adding b you're really subtracting 66,450 and this equation will give you how much it's going to cost to make a units uh, of this product so if you're running a business this is something that you'll need to calculate to figure out how you can make money but again uh, for number eight the key we're just substituting in here uh, into this function which is just an input output machine so substitute in and then just solve for the variable. In this case, our variable was B. All right, next for question number nine, an integer between one and 20 multiplied by itself can end in each of the following digits, except. So when you take an integer, which is just a whole number, uh, between one and 20, and you just multiply it by itself. So well, that means you're just squaring the number. So just have to look at the perfect squares. So 1 squared is equal to 1. Uh, 2 squared is equal to 4. 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 6 squared is 36. 7 squared is 49. 8 squared is 64. 9 squared is 81, and 10 squared is 100, and 11 squared is 121. Now, if you keep going, uh, let's just do 12 squared, which is 144, and that's the end of the timetable, you can actually kind of stop here because what you want to look for is a pattern with the last digit because the units place is what each of these ends in. So 1 squared ends in 1, 4, 9, 6, 5, 6, 9, 4, 1, 0. But once you get to 11, 11 squared is that same 1 here. 12 squared ends in that same 4. And so on and so forth. Um, and that's because pretty much ran out of singles place, uh, unit place digits when you multiply. For example, when you do 12 times 12, the units place is always the same as 2 times 2, which is 4. And remember, you always put a 0 placeholder on the bottom. So then the units place is really the result of this 2 times this 2, which is right here. 
So that's why this pattern will keep repeating. So it can only end in these digits. 1, 4, 9, 6, 5, uh, 6 repeats, 9 repeats, uh, 4 repeats, 1 repeat, and also 0. So those are the only possibilities. So we we'll look for the one except, which means it can't end in 8. You can never end in 8 because 8 doesn't show up as unit place between... 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, all that to uh, 9 squared. 4 shows up because that's 2 squared. 5 shows up because that's 5 squared. 6 is uh, 6 squared. And 9 is 3 squared. So 8 is the only one that doesn't show up. So for number 9, uh, you don't have to write out all the perfect squares up to you know 20 squared. Uh, if you write out the first couple, you'll see a pattern. And then just uh, recognize the pattern. Okay, next for question number 10, a gumball machine contains four types of color gumballs, red, white, blue, and yellow. If the machine dispenses gumballs one at a time, and if the probability of receiving a red gumball is one-third, probability of receiving a white gumball is one-eighth, and blue is one-eighth, how many blue gumballs could be in the machine? All right, so here you have four colors. Uh, you have red, white, blue, and yellow. And probability red is one third. Uh, white is one eighth, and so is blue. Now, since these are only gumballs in the machine, uh, you know that everything has to add up to one. And the total has to be one, or a hundred percent, especially if you have a probability question. So that's a key word here. Uh, so. Uh, you would have to add these three fractions, one-third plus one-eighth plus one-eighth. Here, the LCD is 24. So one-third turns into eight over 24 when you multiply by eight over eight. One-eighth turns into three over 24 when you multiply by three over three. So you add everything up so far. Red, white, and blue uh, gives you a total of 14 over 24. So the yellow, the uh, amount of yellow gumballs has to be one whole minus this 14 over 24. And now one whole, uh, you can rewrite with the LCD of 24. So it turns into 24 over 24 uh, minus 14 over 24. And that will give you 10 out of 24. Or if you simplify, that's 5 twelfths. So there's a 5 12 chance of getting yellow. So once you have all this information, now you want to focus in on the blue gumballs. So if you look at the LCD here, the LCD of all these numbers has to be 24. So you can assume, remember, everything has to be a whole number. So the smallest number that it can be is going to be 24 gumballs. Because that's the LCD of 3, uh, 8, and 12. So if there were 24 gumballs, then you would take blue, which is uh, here, 1 eighth out of this total, 24. And that's going to be 3. Uh, 3 gumballs. So here you can have a possibility in which there are three gumballs in this machine, which is choice A. Uh, now, here, remember, any multiple of three can also work. So because any multiple of three can also work, you can also have six as well. Yeah, so then here there are actually two possible answers. It's actually uh, A or B. So just be careful there. There is a type on the, on the question. But again, here for question number 10, the key was to take the probabilities. You have to add everything up. Uh, and then you have to figure out the total. The LCD is 24. And you have to assume that the, you know, the total could be 24 or 48 or 72 or 96. So any multiple of 24 could work. We just chose the smallest one here because the numbers are a little smaller. For blue, the probability is 1 8th. So you would take 1 8th of 24 to get three gumballs. So that means that 
it has to be a multiple of three gumballs that this machine uh, can contain. Uh, so any multiple of three would work. Here I can see two multiples of three, three and six. So then those are the two possible answers. Right, next for question number 11, the sum of the prices of all groceries in a shopping bag is divided by the number of items, yielding a number x. What does x represent? So here x uh, represents the total price of all the items uh, in a grocery bag divided by the number of items. Now this formula might sound familiar. This actually represents choice D, the average of the groceries, the average price. Number average is the total divided by the number of data. So in this case, if you just take the total, so all the uh, the cost of all the items added up, and then divided by how many items you bought, this will actually give you the average price of the groceries. All right, next for uh, question number 12, the figure above represents four triangles, all equal to... Uh, each other. If triangle ABC is an equilateral triangle with a perimeter of 18, what is the perimeter of the figure outlined by the solid line? So triangle ABC in this dotted line has a perimeter of 18 and it's an equilateral triangle. Equilateral is important because it's a special triangle in which all sides, uh, also angles, are equal. Now here we care about the sides because if all the sides are equal to one another, and the perimeter is equal to 18, then if you just do 18 divided by three, you can actually get each of the sides as six. Now, these all these triangles are actually the same, so they're all congruent. So that means that each of these edges has to be also equal to six. And if you look at the outer, the outermost triangle, you'll likely see that it's made up of uh, each side is equal to 12. Because 6 plus 6 is equal to 12. So just a larger equilateral triangle in which the perimeter is going to be 12 times 3, which is 36. And that is choice D. So here the key word was just equilateral. And equilateral means all sides are equal and all angles are equal. All right, and here's the summary for this page. Uh, be wary of the typo for number 10. Uh, there are two answers there. All right, next for number 13, the graph y equals k of e is shown above. Uh, if k of one is equal to b, which of the following could be the value of k of b? So here, this is your function, but in a graph form. So again, a function is an input output machine. And here, uh, the x's, the x-coordinates are the inputs. The y-coordinate of this line are the outputs. So if you just label everything uh, accordingly, the idea is you put a number into this machine, x, and this function, which is called a k, will actually do something to it, and then you'll get an output y out of it and if you take the x and y you actually form coordinate systems x comma y and each of these points on this line so you can just draw you know uh, draw these points anywhere as long as it's on this line it's a coordinate that matches the input comma output of this function so here we have k of one is equal to b so it's really important to identify which is what. So whatever's inside the parentheses is always the input. So that means that x is equal to 1. So let's identify that. That's right here. x is equal to 1 along this line, this vertical line. Now, b is the output. So let's identify where this output is. Well, if x is equal to 1, what you would need to do is you would have to trace upward and right there, that point here represents 
the value k of 1 and we have to trace it to the left to the y-axis to figure out that this point is actually equal to 3. So this point of 1 comma 3 represents an input of 1 and the output y or in this case it's called b is equal to 3. So this point is 1 comma 3. That's a coordinate. All right, so now that we know that b is 3, we can substitute in because we, we now want to find b, uh, I'm sorry, k of b. So now this means that you want to look for k of 3. Now, 3 is a new input, and that occurs right here. Now let's use a different color. So the new input is x is equal to 3, and now we do the same thing. We trace it up to this point and then now we want to trace it to the left to the y value and that's six so this point corresponds with three comma six on this line so the output is equal to six because the point is three comma six so the answer is choice d k of b or k of three is equal to six again this it's just about reading a line graph. The x values are the inputs. The x's are the inputs. The y's are the outputs for this input-output machine, this function. So just y equals uh, kx, or k of e in this case. All right, next one, number 14, if 0 is less than or equal to a is less than uh, or equal to 6, and negative 2 is less than or equal to b is less than or equal to 6, which of the following gives a set of all possible values of a times b? So the set of all possible values of a times b, the product here, uh, two things you want to find are the minimum values and the maximum values. So uh, maximizing a, b is easy. In order to maximize a, b, you want this product to be really big. So if a has to be between 0 and 6, let's make a really big. And let's make b also really big as well. If you make a equal to 6 and b equal to 6, then a times b will be equal to 36. And we got 36 because that's just 6 times 6. The biggest value of a times the biggest value of b will give us the biggest value of a times b. So the max is 36. So you know that a, b has to be less than or equal to 36. Now, it could be equal to 36 because we have the strong inequality here. It includes the endpoints. Now, the minimum value is a little trickier because uh, in order to minimize uh, a, b, you might think that, oh, we just make the uh, a and b really small but if you make a really small let's say zero and b really small negative two the product is zero but remember when you have a positive times a negative the answer can be the answer is going to be negative so to minimize a b we know that a positive number times a negative number is equal to a negative and that's smaller than zero so it's a little tricky here the minimum is not zero it's actually equal to when um, b is equal to negative 2, the smallest value of b, and when a is actually equal to positive 6. Negative 2, uh, the smallest value of b, times the biggest value of a, positive 6, is actually going to give us a product of negative 12, which is a lot smaller than 0. All right, so it's a little tricky here. If you want to minimize uh, a times b, you have to use the fact that positive times negative numbers is equal to a negative number. So you actually have to maximize a and minimize b. So the smallest value is actually equal to negative 12. And that is choice c and not choice b. All right, choice b, the 0 is not the smallest. All right, so just be careful there for number 14. All right, next for number 15, I have this figure which is not drawn to scale. If the semicircles with centers X, Y, and Z have areas of 12.5 pi, 12.5 pi, and 32 pi, respectively, 
what is the area of the shaded region. So here we have a semicircle, which is just half circles. And the area for a circle is equal to pi r squared. So here the r is, of course, the radius. Now for a semicircle, which is just half of that, uh, the area is going to be one half pi r squared. So that's a formula that we're going to have to use today because, or for this question, because you have half circles. All right, so for x, y, and z, they have 12.5 pi, 12.5 pi, and 32 pi respectively. Respectively means that the order is the same. So for circle x is 12.5, or semicircle x. Uh, for semicircle y, it's 12.5 pi. And then for semicircle z is actually a little larger. It's 32 pi. All right, so semicircles a and x actually have the same uh, the same area. So if you just calculate for uh, x and y, you have 12.5 pi. To set that equal to this formula here, 1 half pi r squared. <coughs> Excuse me, and then you just want to solve for r. So to do that, first you can divide by pi, which is just a number. It's an irrational number. You can divide by that, and that gets rid of it. You have 12.5 is equal to 1 half of r squared. Now, again, you just have to use inverse operations. What do to one side, do to the other side. So here you have multiplying by 1 half. If you multiply by the reciprocal, if you multiply by 2 on both sides, that's actually going to cancel out the 1 half. So then on the left side, you have 2 times 12.5, which is 25. On the right side, you have r squared. Now, the, uh, the opposite or the inverse of squaring is the square root. So you'll take the square root of both sides, and you get that r is equal to 5. It could also be negative 5, but you know that negative 5 doesn't work for at length, so you eliminate that answer. So for uh, semicircles x and y, the radius is 5. So let's try this again. All right, and that's for semicircle X and also Y. All right, so we have that. So then if you just redraw the triangle, uh, the top triangle or these two pieces have 10 as a length, because that's two times the uh, radius. Now, we still want the area, so we actually really just care about the base as well. So in order to calculate the area for the base, you'll have to look at uh, semicircle Z. So for semicircle Z, uh, the area is 32 pi. And again, we set that equal to 1 half pi r squared. Just like before, we could divide both sides by pi. You get that 32 is equal to 1 half r squared. And then if you take uh, both sides and multiply by 2, you get that 64 is equal to r squared. That will cancel out the 1 half. And then when you take the square root on both sides, you get that r is equal to positive or negative 8, but you can't have negative 8 for a length. So 8 is the... A radius for the base. For the bottom of a semicircle, which means that the total side here is 16. Now, uh, once we have all the parts of this uh, triangle, you can actually figure out the height because in order to figure out the triangle's height, or in order to figure out the area, we need one half base times height. So we have the base. Uh, now we just need the height. So now this is where you can actually use uh, a little bit of geometry. If you have an isosceles triangle in which two sides are equal, you can actually draw a vertical height going down the middle. And this is a perpendicular bisector.
And what this means is that this perpendicular bisector cuts the opposite side into two equal pieces, and it's also perpendicular, it's 90 degrees to the base. And this only works if you have an isosceles or a uh, equilateral triangle, and we do have that here. So each of these triangles are now, these half triangles are right triangles, and that's going to be important because we can use the Pythagorean for this. So if you cut the bottom in half, one piece is going to be 8. This hypotenuse is actually 10, and we just have to figure out the height, h. Now, we can use Pythagorean because that works for all right triangles. It says a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, but we actually have a triplet here, and Pythagorean triplets are nice whole number triplets that satisfy this a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Specifically, we have a 3, 4, 5, or a, a multiple of 3, 4, 5, a 6, 8, 10. So 3, 4, 5 triangle, these are three uh, lengths that satisfy Pythagorean theorem. All of the multiples also work as well. And we actually have a 6, 8, 10 situation here. We have a hypotenuse of 10. Uh, one side is, one of the legs is 6, or sorry, one of the legs is 8. So then the other side, the other leg has to be 6. Because this is your 6, 8, 10 special right triangle. Now, if you forgot the Pythagorean triplets here, that's fine. Uh, you can actually just do this the long way. For example, if you call uh, this height h, you'll do 8 squared plus h squared is equal to 10 squared. 8 squared is 64, and 10 squared is 100. So you'll have to subtract 64 from both sides. You get that h squared is equal to 36, and when you do the square root on both sides, you get that h is equal to 6. Now that's you know a lot of work. Uh, you can also just memorize 6, 8, 10, or well, memorize it for 5. And the other one that you also have to know is 5, 12, 13, and all the multiples as well. So like 10, 24, 26, etc., etc. But these are the two important ones. So we know that the height is equal to 6. So we should know that the height is equal to 6 and... The base is actually equal to 16. Uh, you can get the error of the triangle, which is 1 half base times height. And this isosceles triangle has a height equal to 6, base equal to 16. So that's going to be 1 half 16 times 6, which is going to be the same as 8 times 6, which is 48. So the triangle's area is 48. So if you add everything together, you have... 12.5 pi, 12.5 pi plus 32 pi, that's the same as 32 plus 25, or 57 pi. And you also have to add this 48. So the answer is going to be choice B, 57 pi plus 48. So here's a summary for number 15. Again, the key to doing this question is to use the formula for the area of a semicircle, which is half of the area of a circle, and also Pythagorean theorem. Again, because of this perpendicular bisector uh, for an isosceles triangle. All right, next for number 16, the first term in a sequence is a fraction. The second term in a sequence is four larger than two times a fraction. If one over x is the first number of the sequence and x is not equal to zero, what is the ratio of the first term to the second term? So the first term, the first number is one over x. And then to get to the next term, you have to follow this rule, four larger than two times. So times means multiply, let me do that first. And then four larger than means plus. So you'll be doubling this fraction first, and then you'll be adding four. So when you take one over x and you double it, and you add four, that's gonna give you two over x plus four as a second term. Now what you're looking for uh, is actually a ratio of the first term to the second term.
So the first term is 1 over x. The second term is 2 over x plus 4. And now if you want to divide fractions, this is your complex fraction. It's a fraction inside a fraction. You can have to rewrite this and then do keep change flip. So this middle fraction bar is really a division symbol. So it's 1 over x divided by 2 over x plus 4. And before you keep change flip, uh, you can have to turn 2 over x plus 4 into just one fraction by simplifying. Uh, right now, the 4 doesn't have a denominator. So you could put 1 in there. The LCD is equal to x. So when you uh, rewrite this as the LCD of x, it will turn this into 2 over x plus 4x over x. You just multiply the second term by x over x which is the form of 1. So when you add, uh, this will be 4x plus 2 over x. And this is what you're flipping. So when you have 1 over x divided by 4x plus 2 over x, and you want to keep change flip, that's going to be 1 over x times x over 4x plus 2. Now, because you know that x is not equal to 0, you're not dividing by x. Uh, so you can actually cancel out the x in numerator with this x in denominator. And you're left with 1 over 4x plus 2. Uh, x also can't be equal to negative uh, 1 half. Because if x is equal to negative 1 half, then the denominator will be 0 and you can't have that. But here the answer is choice A. So the key here was to add fractions and then use KCF to simplify the division of two fractions. All right, and here is the summary for this page. All right, next for question number one, if k is an integer and the absolute value of 1 minus k is less than 1, which of the following could be the value of k? So here we have an absolute value uh, inequality. And the formal way to solve this question is to actually split this in absolute value into two pieces. So when you have an absolute value, uh, the symbol is a really long line here, or two of them, uh, the absolute value of x actually breaks down into two scenarios. Now, if x, if the stuff inside the parentheses is greater than or equal to zero, then the absolute value of x is just equal to x. So it just goes away. Nothing happens. So if x is zero or positive, it just stays zero or positive. But if the stuff inside the parentheses of x is less than zero, then the absolute value of x, remember x is a negative number, you'll actually negate it. So the absolute value of x will turn into negative x. You multiply by negative one, and it'll turn a negative number into a positive number. So those are two scenarios here. So really, the absolute value of one minus k You want to solve this formally and not, you know, substitute in. Uh, breaks down into two scenarios. If one minus k is greater than or equal to zero, the positive case, so the stuff inside is positive, and also the negative case if one minus k was less than zero. So the positive case is easy on the right. If one minus k is positive, then the absolute value just goes away. So you have one minus k less than one. And to solve for k, you solve uh, this inequality just like you were solving a regular equation. What did you do to one side? You got to do it to the other side. Uh, here, you would have to add k to both sides. And you have 1 is less than 1 plus k, and then subtract 1 from both sides. You will get that k has to be greater than 0. So k is positive. So that's one side of this uh, solution. Now, it gets a little more tricky if 1 minus k is negative on the left side. So here, if it's negative, you'll have to actually negate 1 minus k on the left side. 
So because 1 minus k is a negative number, you have to negate that negative number, and then it'll be less than, uh, I'm sorry, not less than 0, less than 1. This is a 1 on the other side. All right, now here's a tricky part. When you have inequalities, if you divide both sides by negative 1, you actually have to flip the sign. For uh, inequality, so just be careful there. That's a a common mistake that a lot of people forget to do. So if you divide both sides by negative one, remember there's an invisible one there. You can get rid of that. On the left side, you have one minus k, but now this less than turns into greater than, and one divided by negative one is negative one. Now you can add k to both sides. And you have 1 is greater than negative 1 plus k. And then you would have to add 1 to both sides. And that'll give you k is less than 2. So that's the other side. k has to be less than 2, but greater than 0. So this is your solution set for all possible values of k. Uh, if you, oh, uh, so the answer is choice D. If you want to graph this, because this is also something that you'll need to graph uh, or be able to graph, you have the endpoints 0 and 2. Because this is the weak inequality, it doesn't include the endpoints 0 and 2. So k cannot be equal to 0, k cannot be equal to 2. This is a weak inequality. It doesn't include the endpoints, so you have to use open circles here for 0 and 2, and then you shade everything in between. So that's how you would formally solve this. Absolute value inequality, um, they, they are pretty complicated because absolute values turn into two scenarios here. So you have to take into consideration both of those scenarios. Now, the easier way to do this question, uh, in my opinion, is probably just to substitute in. Because you have these choices, just replace each of these choices into the equation, and it's supposed to work. For example, for choice D, it's 1, so replace k with 1, and you want to see if that's less than 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0, so the absolute value of 0 is in fact less than 1 because it's just 0. So everything does work. All the other choices won't work. For example, if you substitute in choice E, the absolute value of 1 minus 2 is absolute value of negative 1, which turns into a positive 1. 1 is not less than 1. For choice C, same thing, 1 minus 0 is 1, and the absolute value of 1, which is 1, is not less than 1. Only choice D works because it's in between 0 and 2. So that's how you would solve this formally, but a shortcut here is just to substitute in by, uh, or check by substitution. All right, next for number two in the cube above, its interior faces were painted blue. Or its exterior faces, I should say. Uh, if the cube is cut into 27 smaller cubes, how many smaller cubes have unpainted faces? So this is your rubrics cube, and if you paint all the outside, uh, and I have to see, well, how many of these, 20, of these 27 pieces are not painted? Well, there's only one piece, and it's a piece right in the center. So you can't really see it, but the P is right in the middle. So kind of like right there. The center piece uh, is not on the edge at all. It has, n has uh, no exposed sides. So it will not be painted. The corners will be painted. The eight corners will be painted three times. Uh, and then some of the surface, the other surfaces will either be painted two or uh, one time. Uh, but the central cube has no exposed sides it's at the core of this uh, Rubik's cube. So it's not touching the edge, so therefore it won't be painted. And there's only one piece in there. Next for question number three, Jane started her postage stamp collection with 30 stamps. And then she increased her collection by adding five stamps per week. We said the following represents the total number of stamps in her collection at the end of W weeks. 
So she started with 30 stamps, so this is the base. And now the keyword here is per week, five stamps per week. Per means multiply or divide, just like the word each. Now in this case, we're gonna to wanna to multiply because we want the total. You want to know the total number of stamps. Because you want the total, uh, we, you're gonna to have to multiply it to get to a bigger number. If you already have the total, you'll divide uh, to get a smaller number. But here you want to multiply because you want the total. So after, if you have five stamps every week and if you have W weeks, you'll be adding five W to that starting amount of 30. Now, I don't see that as one of the answer choices here, and that's because you have to factor out this five. So both of these terms, that's a common factor of five. So if you factor out the five, that's just the opposite of the distributed property. You have five and then parentheses, you're multiplying uh, six plus W. Now you can always double check your work by doing distributive. So that's a really good way to check your work. When you distribute this five across the sum, you have five times six plus five times W or 30 plus five W. So that's exactly what we have. So the answer is choice D. You just have to turn the word sentence to a number sentence here. The two key words are per and total. All right, next for question number four, if A over B is equal to three and B over C is equal to one half and C over D is equal to two thirds, uh, what is the value of two A over D? All right, so here we have a whole bunch of these uh, variables and or these ratios, I should say. Uh, the first thing that you wanna do, this three is really a three over one. So now you have these ratios. A over B is equal to three over one. But you know that B over C is one half. So because the variable B shows up in both and they're both equal to one, you can actually make the connection A over C is equal to three over two. All right, so then you'll just have to keep kind of you know, following this chain here. If B over C is equal to 1 over 2, and C over D is equal to 2 over 3, again, C is your connection this time. B over D is equal to 1 over 3. So here, um, all the numbers actually kind of connect. So then if A over C is 3 over 2, and then B over D is 1 over 3, everything essentially connects here. A being... 3 and D being 3, you have A over D is equal to 3 over 3 as well. So here, if you have 2 times A over D, if you double A, that will be 6 over 3 or 2. So the answer would be choice C. Uh, so be careful, here, just another uh, typo. All right, next for question number five, if seven different lines uh, lie on a plane, what is the greatest number of intersections? So plane uh, in math is just a flat surface. So think of it just like a you know, sheet of paper uh, or a chalkboard or uh, the XY plane, which is the Cartesian plane here. It's just all the points on this coordinate system. So just a flat surface. Um, so you have seven lines, and you want to make sure they intersect a lot. So just start drawing lines. For example, one line is here. To make this line intersect with the second line, you can make one intersection. Now, if you want to draw another line and you want to intersect both of them, you draw them like this to have the triangle. So you have three lines so far. And then you want to have another line that intersects everything. So the fourth line will look something like this. And then the fifth line will have to intersect uh, everything again. So you'll have something like this. 
you can kind of see a pattern here. Uh, the first time you intersected uh, once, then twice, then three times, and four times. Uh, so there's the there's a pattern here. Uh, anyway, so you have four lines so far. You still need five. Uh, the sixth line will look something like this. To intersect five times. Two, three, four, five. And then the last and final seventh line will have to intersect everything uh, seven times. Oh, sorry, six times. So it'll be one, two, three, four, five. Uh, oh, and I'm missing this one. There you go. So if you just add everything up, uh, you have one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Choice C. Uh, or between lines, you can uh, have the pattern here. Between lines one and two, you have one intersection. Then when you draw the third line in, you have two intersections. Then three intersections. Then four intersections. Five intersections and six intersections. So the numbers that you're adding are one, two, three, four, five, and six for a total of 21. Remember to add these numbers quickly, you can pair them up kind of like a rainbow. So then you have seven, 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 or 21. Next for question number six, if m raised to the a power times m raised to the b power is equal to m raised to the fifth power, and m raised to the 2a power raised to the b power is equal to m to the 12th power, which of the following could be a value of a? So here we have a lot of exponents uh, with the base of m, and we're going to have to use uh, some of the laws of exponents. So for the first Equation there, m raised to the a times m raised to the b is equal to m raised to the fifth. You're going to use this law of exponent that states that b to the a times b to the c. When you multiply two exponents with the same base, you have to add the exponents. So this is the law of exponent that we're going to be applying to the first equation. So since you have m raised to the a times m raised to the b, that's equal to m to the fifth. Here on the left, m raised to the a times m raised to the b is really m raised to the a plus b, and that's equal to m raised to the fifth, and we're just applying this law here. And now the exponents have to be equal to one another because these two things are equal. So you know that a plus b has to be equal to 5. So that's the first equation. All right, And now for the second equation, you have m raised to the 2a raised to the b is equal to m raised to the 12th. This is going to require this law that states b raised to the a raised to the c power, power to a power. You're going to have to multiply the exponents. So you have to apply that law to uh, the second equation. So you have m raised to the 2a raised to the b. So you go to b Oops, it's equal to uh, m raised to the 12th. So once you apply this law on the left side, you'll have to multiply these two exponents. You'll have m raised to the 2a times b is equal to m raised to the 12th. Or, since the bases are the same now, you know that 2ab has to be equal to 12. If you divide by 2, you know that ab has to be equal to 6. All right, so you have two equations and two variables that you can solve. If uh, a plus b has to be equal to 5 and a times b has to be equal to 6, here all the choices are actually whole numbers, so you can actually just guess and check. You know that 2 plus 3 is equal to 5 and 2 times 3 is equal to 6. So it could be either one. I don't see 2 here, but I do see choice A, 3. So you can do this by guessing and checking because all the choices are whole numbers. Now, if you didn't have any choices and you needed to solve for this uh, algebraically, you can do that as well. 
because this is a system of equations, you can use substitution or you can also use elimination to help you solve. Here, substitution is easier uh, because uh, one of these equations, you actually have A times B, so you really would have to substitute. So if you take the first equation, A plus B is equal to 5, uh, and you subtract A from both sides, for example, you would get that B is equal to 5 minus A. And you would take 5 minus A and replace that here to the second equation. So then the equation will actually turn into, instead of A times B is equal to 6, you know that B is really 5 minus A. And now you can distribute. And that will give you 5 times a minus a squared is equal to 6. And this is your quadratic. And in order to solve for quadratics, you have to move everything over to one side. So that means that you have to add a squared and subtract 5a on both sides. So then on the right side, you'll have a squared minus 5a plus 6 is equal to 0. And now you want to look for factors when you factor, you want to look for factors of the last term, which in this case is 6. And the factors of 6 are 2, 3, 1, and 6. And one of these pairs will actually add up to negative 5. And now both of them have to be positive or both of them have to be negative. And that happens when you have negative 2 and negative 3. So you have a minus 2 times a minus 3. Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. And a negative 2 plus negative 3 is negative 5. So that's how you get the positive 6 and this negative 5. Now we have to use the zero property. So either a minus 2 is equal to 0 or a minus 3 is equal to 0 to solve for a. a could either be 2 or a could be equal to 3. So this is how you would solve this algebraically using quadratics. It's a little, uh, it's a lot of steps. But here it's a lot easier to just substitute in because you have choices and they're all whole numbers so substituting in would probably be the best bet but later on you also have to know how to uh, solve this algebraically especially solving this quadratic here which is actually really important to solve but uh for the main parts of this question you have to use the two laws of exponents power to a power multiply the exponents and then also here, if you multiply two exponents to the same base, you have to add the exponents. All right, next for number seven, at a grocery store, an apple and a pear cost 75 cents, a pear and a banana cost 55 cents, and an apple and a banana cost 50 cents. What is the cost of an apple? So you have to come up with, uh, turn the word sentence to a number sentence, and this is actually your system of equations. Apple and pear, so A plus P is equal to 75. I'll just put everything in cents, so I'm not dealing with decimals. And then for the second equation, P and B is equal to 55. And then finally, A and B is equal to 50. So you want the cost of just the apple. So you're going to have to solve uh, the system of equations using either substitution or elimination. So if you look at the bottom two equations, for example, they both have B in it. To solve the system of equations, uh, using elimination will actually be easier here. But you can always use substitution, so either strategy is fine. Elimination is easier because we can actually eliminate one of the variables directly. They're both in standard form of linear uh, an equation of a line. So that's why elimination is a little bit easier. If you write out these two equations and you subtract the entire equation, you'll have P minus A and then B minus b which will cancel out and you have 55 minus 50 so you know that p minus a is equal to 5. now you can bring in the first equation you know that a plus p is equal to 75 so if you take these two equations you add now the a's the negative a and the positive a they actually get eliminated and you have p plus p or 2p is equal to 80 
And if you divide by 2, just using inverse operations, you get that the pair is 40 cents. Once you know that the pair is 40 cents, you can substitute back in to solve for A. So you know that A plus P is equal to 75, but P is equal to 40. So A plus 40 has to be 75. If you subtract 40 from both sides, you get that A is equal to 35 cents, which is choice C. Now we can also check our work by substituting into the other equations, just to double check. P plus B has to be 55, and P is equal to 40. So B, the banana, has to be 15 cents. And then double check with this last equation, A plus B has to be 50. The apple is 35 cents, the banana is 15 cents, 35 plus 15 is in fact equal to 50, so all these three equations check out. So you know that the apple is 35 cents, banana is 15 cents, and the pear is uh, 40 cents. So that's how you would solve using substitution and elimination here for the system of equations. Just turn a word sentence to a number sentence, and then either substitute or eliminate. Uh, to solve for the variables one at a time. All right, next for number eight, you got to find the sum of the first 25 positive odd integers. Okay, so just start writing some of them out to see if you can have a pattern. The first positive odd integer on um, positive odd whole number is one, then three, then five, seven, nine, etc. So the first number, the second number is here, the third number. So you don't want to write everything out, but you can kind of see a pattern here. Uh, if you double each of the numbers and then subtract 1, so the nth odd number will be 2n minus 1. That's a pattern here. If you take 1 times 2, that's 2 minus 1, you get 1. To get uh, 3 from 2, you take 2 times 2, which is 4 minus 1, and you get 3. Now for third one, 3 times 2 is 6, subtract 1, you'll get 5. The fourth number will be 4 times 2, which is 8, minus 1 is 7, etc. So the 25th odd number uh, will be 25 times 2, which is 50, and then you subtract 1, that's going to be 49. So you want to add all the numbers all the way up to 49. All right, so now that's a lot of numbers, though. But one thing to, uh, one thing that we can do when you're adding a list of numbers where there is a pattern is you can actually uh, pair them up in a very specific way. For example, if you pair up the first and the last number, one plus forty nine will be fifty. The second number and the second to last number. Because of this nice pattern, you're just adding by 2 each time. 3 plus 47 is also 50. And then the next number here is 45. So 5 plus 45 is also 50. And again, that's not a coincidence. So if you pair them up in this way, if you have 25 numbers, you know that you have 12 pairs of 2. And that's going to be 12 and each pair is going to be 50, so 12 times 50 will be 600. So you know that the sum has to be greater than 600. So right off the bat, you can eliminate A, B, C, and D. It has to be choice E, because that's the only one that's greater than 600. Now you also have to uh, add the last number, the one number in the middle. And the number in the middle is the median, and because you have... This pattern, to get the median, you just take the sum and divide it by 2. The middle number is actually 25. So take each of these pairs, which are equal to 50. The middle number here has to be half of that, which is always going to be 25. So 600 plus 25 is 625. So the answer is choice E. Now, the other way to do this question is because you have a list of consecutive numbers. If you have a list of consecutive numbers, the average is equal to the median. 
And that's always true. When you have a list of numbers that have this pattern. Now, this can actually help because you know that the median is 25. It's just a number in the middle. So when you write out this list, you, you know, figure out the first term and the last term and the middle number is 25. So the average is, remember, the total sum divided by here, 25, because you have 25 numbers. So to find the total sum, you'll just multiply by 25 on both sides. And the total has to be 25 times 25 or 625. So if you've come up with this list, you don't have to do any of the pairing up. You just use the fact that the average is equal to the median. And the average, remember, is the total divided by the number of data. And you want the total here. So that's a piece of the average formula. So that's the other way to solve this problem. All right, next for number nine. Ashley is twice as old as Carlos. And Bobby is five years younger than Ashley. If the sum of the ages of the three children is S, how old is Carlos in terms of S? So you just have to turn the word sentence to a number sentence. Ashley is twice as old as Carlos. Twice means times two. So A is equal to two times C. Now, Bobby is five years younger. So younger means subtract. So Bobby B is going to be Ashley, which is A minus five. Now, if you add the three people up, A, Ashley plus uh, Bobby plus Carlos, that's equal to S. You have to substitute everything in. And because you want to know Carlos's age in terms of S, you have to isolate C. So put everything in terms of C. So you know that A is equal to 2C, so you can substitute in 2C in for A. And on B is equal to A minus 5, so you can replace A with 2C. So that will turn to 2C minus 5. And now you could take this and substitute in here. And again, this is the equation that we want to solve for. So you'll be adding 2C minus 5, and then C just equal to C. That's equal to S. Now you have to combine like terms. So 2C, 2C, and this is really 1C are like terms. And we add the coefficients, you have 5C. And you're subtracting 5, and that's equal to S. So you want to solve for C. Uh, so that means you'll have to choose inverse operations. And what if you did it one side, you got to do it the other side. First, you got to add 5. So you have S plus 5 is equal to 5c, then you divide by 5 on both sides, and you get that c is equal to s plus 5 divided by 5. Now, I don't see that here, but you can actually simplify this uh, by taking this denominator, or this fraction really, and splitting it into two fractions. You have s over 5 plus 5 over 5. Because the LCD is 5. So you can actually split this fraction into two pieces. Or I'll put the, the S looks like 5, so I'll highlight the uh, S. So S over 5 uh, just you know, stays the same. But then 5 over 5 turns into 1, and that turns into choice C. It turns into S over 5 plus 1. So here for question number 9, you just have to turn the word sentence to a number sentence. And then you have to uh, substitute twice and isolate and solve for C in terms of S by using inverse operations. And then you get choice C. Now, the other way to do this question is to actually just substitute in different numbers. So because you don't know how old any of these people are, you could just pretend that Ashley is you know, 10 years old and then Carlos is 5 years old and then... Uh, Bobby would also be uh, five in this case. And then just go through all the choices and see which one of the choices adds up to, uh, this would be five plus five plus 10 or 20. And I think choice C is the only one that would add up to 20. Or uh, would be the only one that would add up to Carlos's age of five. If you replace S with 20. 
All right. Oh, uh, but one thing to keep in mind, if you do use that method, just be careful because sometimes you'll have to, you might have two choices that gives you the same answer. So you'll have to substitute in a new set of uh, values. So just be wary of that because it might take a while. All right, next for number 10, a list consists of 20 positive numbers. A new list of these 20 numbers is formed by adding 5 to each of the original numbers. Now, if m is the average, the arithmetic mean of the original list, and then k is the average of the new list, which of the following must be true? So let's make this easy. If you have a list of numbers, let's call it the original list, you know, just 20 ones. So the average here is obviously going to be 1. Now, the new list, if you add 5 to each of the numbers, now it's all 6. So you have 20 sixes. So the new average now be 6. And if you just look at 1 versus 6, because you added 5 to each of the numbers, the average also increases by 5 as well. So the answer is choice C. K, the new average, is equal to the old average, just plus 5, because you added 5 to each of the numbers. So here we just model this question using easy numbers, uh, and you could just substitute back in and solve for, uh, and get the answer as choice C. All right, and here's the summary for this page. All right, next for number one, if the absolute value of x is less than 5 and the absolute value of x is greater than 2, how many integers satisfy both of these two inequalities? So here we see absolute value again. Remember, absolute value. The absolute value of x splits into two scenarios, if x is positive or if the stuff inside is negative. If x is positive, the absolute value of x is just equal to x, but if the stuff inside is negative, uh, it will turn to negative x. So here, for the absolute value of x has to be less than 5, uh, you can actually split this up into two choices, if x is positive or if x is negative. If x is positive, then x has to be less than 5. But if x is negative, the negative of x is less than 5. And here, you got to be careful. Uh, if you multiply or divide by negative numbers, you have to flip the inequality sign. So that's the only caveat if you are solving inequalities, especially for absolute value inequalities. So since negative x is less than 5, x would actually be greater than negative 5. So if you had to multiply both sides by negative 1 and then flip the sign. So those are true. Then you have uh, the next equation, or inequality to say the absolute value of x is greater than 2. So again, you have two scenarios, the positive and the negative case. So the absolute value of x, sorry, in the positive case, x is just greater than 2. For the negative case, negative of x is, great, is uh, greater than 2. And if you multiply both sides by negative 1, x will be less than negative 2. Now, uh, each of these are ors because, uh, or excuse me, each of these are ands. So x has to be, again, they're open circles at negative 5 and positive 5. And here, uh, this one's actually uh, or, because you can't be greater than 2 and less than negative 2. So just look for the overlap uh, between each of these. Remember, uh, these are open circles here. So if you look at the overlap, it has to be less than 5, but greater than 2. If you look at those two, there's an overlap there. So x could either be 3 or 4. That would work for both of these. Now for the other side, 
uh, x has to be greater than negative 5, but less than negative 2. So x could be negative 3 or negative 4. And again, you have another 2 uh, overlap here between this part, just negative 3 and negative 4 within this overlap. So in total, there are choice D four numbers. X could either be positive or minus 3, positive or minus 4. And that's it. Remember, they have to be integers, so they have to be whole numbers. All right, so again, to solve absolute value inequalities, you have to split up, uh, split each of these into two scenarios. If the stuff inside is positive or if the stuff inside is negative. And then just uh, solve that way. Again, if you're multiplying or dividing by negative numbers, you got to flip the inequality sign. That's really important, especially when you have absolute value inequalities. Uh, the other way is just to substitute in and just keep guessing and checking. All right, for question number two, figure that on a scale. In the figure above, if OP is equal to OQ, what is the value of T? So OP and OQ are equal, so this is actually an isosceles triangle. Uh, here, we can actually get the distance of OP because O is the origin, which is 0, comma 0. And we can use the distance formula, which is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Now, this is a lot, you know, to, to take in, but you don't have to substitute in. This distance formula actually comes from Pythagorean theorem. If p is at negative 3, comma 4, and this is 0, comma 0, if you draw a right triangle here, the distance between 0, the x is a 0, and negative 3 is actually 3. And then the distance between the y value, 0 and 4, is 4. So now you actually have a right triangle in which the two legs are 3 and 4. This should be familiar. This is your Pythagorean triplet. Specifically, your 3, 4, 5 special right triangle that satisfies a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So the hypotenuse is equal to 5. So this distance has to be 5, which means this distance is also 5. Now, because point Q is also on the x-axis, t has to be equal to negative 5 because the distance between 0 and negative 5 has to be equal to 5. So Q is equal to negative 5 comma 0. Uh, specifically, the value T is choice A, negative 5. So again, we have to figure out that this was an isosceles triangle. And we use, uh, you can either use a distance formula here or just draw a right triangle for Pythagorean. A squared plus B squared to C squared. Or if you remember the Pythagorean triplets, that's going to save you a lot of time. Uh, and you figure out that the distance is 5. So then you also move 5 to the left to get to point Q, and that'll give you negative 5 for T. All right, next for number 3. If 1 over K is greater than 1 half, which of the following must be true? So here you have an uh, inequality, and again, to solve just like equations, so what you can do is you can multiply both sides by 2 and then multiply both sides by k. Again, we have to assume that k is, let's say, positive. If you multiply both sides by 2, let's start on there. You'll have 2 over k is greater than 1. And then if you multiply by k, you'll have 2 is greater than k. So k has to be less than 2 if k is positive. Uh, now, k has to be positive because you can't have a negative number here. 1 over a negative number can never be greater than 1 half because 1 over negative is negative. And negative numbers cannot be greater than positive. That's, that's just wrong. So k has to be greater than 0. 
but K has to be less than 2. And that's choice D. Uh, you can also substitute your numbers to double check. For example, if K is equal to 1, uh, 1 over K would be 1 over 1, and 1 over 1 just equal to positive 1, which is greater than 1 half. And if K is a decimal between 0 and 1, uh, the fraction actually get even larger. So to solve for number 3, you can substitute in, but uh, you can also just multiply both sides by 2, the denominator, and then uh, just figure out the inequality that way. And you get choice D. Uh, next for question number 4. If the average or the arithmetic mean of 6 consecutive odd integers is M, which of the following is the expression for the smallest odd integer? So here, if you have consecutive numbers, which means they follow a pattern, so you keep adding the same number each time, for example. Remember, the average for a list of consecutive numbers is also equal to the median. That is always true. And this is a shortcut that you can use here. For example, you have six numbers. Uh, so the average is m and remember when you have an even number of numbers m is also the median as well so to figure out the expression for the smallest odd integer here uh, you have to actually just go backwards if the average is m this number here will be m minus one this number will be m plus one and this will be m minus 3 and m plus 3. Remember, you you have odd numbers, so you have to skip uh, skip a number. Then the smallest will be m plus 5. The biggest will be... Uh, the smallest will be m minus 5. The biggest will be m plus 5. And that's choice D. Remember, m is going to be even because it's in between two odd numbers. So we can actually just substitute in random numbers here to... Let's work it out. For example, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. If these are your six numbers, your six odd numbers, the average is equal to the median, which is equal to m. In this case, it's actually 6. So the smallest number 1 is actually 6 minus 1, or m, or sorry, uh, 6 minus 5, or m minus 5. And that is choice D. So this is a good way to uh, check your work here. Again, you're not given any restrictions. Here's you just pick the six smallest positive odd integers, and you could just uh, work it out from there. Okay, uh, well, next one, number five. Let the function f be defined by f of x is equal to ax plus b, where a and b are constants. If a times b is negative, or less than zero, which of the following graphs could be the graph of f? So when you have this function, this input-output machine, uh, remember y is equal to f of x, that's the output. And when you have y equals ax plus b, this is your linear function, which is just a straight line. Uh, a, the coefficient of x, is your slope, and b is your y-intercept. So you know that your slope times a y-intercept is negative. So just go through all the choices and see which one has a slope times a y-intercept that is negative. Uh, just looking at pictures. So the y-intercept is easy here. The y-intercept is positive. It intersects the y-axis as a positive number. And the slope, because this line is going up, the slope is also equal to a positive number because it's going up when you go from left to right. So it's like you're walking up the mountain. So the positive slope. And you know that positive times positive, A times B has to be greater than zero here, which is not what we're looking for. So A is wrong. All right, for choice B, we see that the y-intercept here is zero. And you know that anything times 0 is equal to 0. So A times B is equal to 0 here. A is positive because it's also going up. The slope is positive. 
and a positive number times zero is always equal to zero. Again, that's not negative. You want a negative number here, so B is also wrong. All right, for choice C, notice that this line is going down when you go from left to right, so the slope is negative. But if you look at a y-intercept, it intersects a y-axis right here. B is negative as well. And when you have A times B, a negative times a negative is actually equal to a positive because the negatives cancel out. So A times B is also greater than zero here. Again, not what you want. You want something less than zero. So they can't both be negative. Now in choice D, here we have a y-intercept B, which is positive, but this is a horizontal line. It's not going up or down, and that means that the slope is equal to zero. So a slope of zero times a positive y-intercept, A times B is going to be zero again. Again, not what we're looking for. We want a negative result, so the answer has to be choice E. And the answer choice E, because if you look at the slope, it's going up when you go from left to right, so the slope is positive. Now the y-intercept here is actually below the axis, so the y-intercept is negative, so b is less than zero. And when you have a positive slope times the y-intercept, which is negative, positive times negative is negative, so a times b is negative, and that's what we're looking for here. So that's why the answer is e. Again, you want to look for one, a graph in which the slope times the y-intercepts are negative. So for question number five, the answer is E. All right, so for question number five, it's really about just reading a linear function where y equals mx plus b. In this case, the coefficient a is a slope, b, the constant, is the y-intercept. And here's a summary for this page. For number six, you have this right triangle. In the figure above, the perimeter of the triangle is 9 plus 3 root 3. What's the value of x? So here you have a triangle that's well, not drawn a scale, but it's a right triangle. And as you know, for right triangles, we can use Pythagorean theorem. We don't know what x are, so we have to use Pythagorean, which states that a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. So here, we don't know what that missing side is, so we can just call that A. If you substitute in for Pythagorean, you'll have A squared plus X squared, the sum of the two legs squared, is equal to the hypotenuse, which is 2X, in parentheses, squared. Now, uh, we have to actually use this law of exponent that states that if you're multiplying two things inside parentheses, raised to the C power, it's kind of like the distributive property where you're doing a to the c times b to the c power. So we have to apply that here. So on the right side, you actually get 2 squared, or 4, times x squared. So we have to apply the power of 2 to both the 2 and the x inside the parentheses. Now we can actually subtract x squared on both sides. And remember, when you do that, the coefficient is really 1. So you have a squared is equal to 4 minus 4x squared minus 1x squared, or 3x squared. And then, to solve for a, you'll do the square root on both sides. And now you have to do this law of exponent. The square root of a times b is equal to the square root of a times the square root of b. The square root is really just a one-half power, so it's really a law of exponent here. So the square root of a squared is just equal to a. They canceled out. And here you'll have the square root of 3x squared, which is the square root of 3, times the square root of x squared. And the square root of x squared, uh, again, this cancels out. So you have the square root of 3 times x, or you really rewrite this as x root 3. So now you have the three sides in terms of x. You know that the perimeter is equal to 9 plus 3 root 3. So you set that equal to 2x plus x plus x root 3. 
Now, 2x and x are like terms, so you have 9 plus 3 root 3 is equal to, here this is 2x plus 1x, or 3x plus x root 3. And here you can kind of see that only one number for x works, because a 3x has to be the 3, uh, has to be equal to the 9, and then 3 root 3 has to be equal to x root 3. So 3 root 3 is equal to x root 3, divide both sides by root 3, x has to be equal to 3, and that also works as 3 times 3 is equal to 9. So x has to be equal to 3, twice a. This is actually also one of your special right triangles. This is your 30, 60, 90 special right triangle. And you can tell that because those sides are in a ratio of x, 2x, and x root 3. So here, the side opposite of 30 degrees is x. Opposite of 90 is 2x. And opposite of 60, it's x root 3. So you can also, if you recognize the 30, 60, 90 right triangle, you can also use that as a shortcut as well uh, to get the x root 3 right off the bat without doing Pythagorean. All right, next for number seven. If two coins are selected from a collection consisting of two pennies, two nickels, two dimes, and two quarters, how many different sums are possible? So you have two pennies, so you can just write one cent, one cent. Two nickels are five and five. Two dimes are 10 and 10. And then two quarters are 25 and 25. And you just want to order them so that you have different sums. So you can have, let's say, uh, two pennies. So again, you're just choosing two. So two pennies is equal to two. Now you can have a penny and a nickel. So that's uh, six. Then you can have a penny and a dime. And you also have a penny plus a quarter. So that's sort of the pattern here. Penny plus dime is 11. Penny plus quarter is 26. All right, so that's everything with pennies. Now, when you do the same thing for nickels, you already have the nickel and the penny. That's right here. So you don't want to include that anymore. So you just have two nickels, which is equal to 10. Since you already have nickels and pennies, you will jump to nickels and dimes and nickels and quarters. So that's going to be 15 and then 30. And finally, for dimes, you already have dimes and pennies and dimes and nickels. Or dimes and nickels here. So you only want two dimes which is equal to 20, and then you just want dimes of quarters, and that's equal to 35. And last but not least, for the quarters, you have quarters with pennies, quarters with nickels, and quarter with dimes. Right here, quarter penny, quarter plus nickel, quarter plus dime. So the only new thing is just two quarters, which is equal to 50. So if you add everything up, just see how many different combinations you can make. You have 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1, or twice A, 10. So that's a pattern. 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1. So for number 7, just make a chart, get organized, and then kind of just figure out the uh, answer that way. But just remember, order uh, doesn't matter here. So that means that uh, penny plus Dime is equal to dime plus penny. It's 11 cents. So it doesn't matter which order you pick them out of the uh, bag. All right, next for number eight. Uh, here at the table below shows the number of members of a family for 200 employees at World Computer Company this year. What sort of following can be determined from the information in the table? So you have the number of family members or the number of members in the family and you have the number of employees so this is a frequency table so you can also use these uh tally marks to indicate that now uh can you figure out room number one the average number of uh, members of a family of all the employees well here normally to do the average you need the total sum divided by the number of data. In this case, you want the total number of family members plus the number of families. 
Now, the problem here is here. When you have fewer than two, that's two or one. You don't know how many people only have one person in the family or how many people have two people in the family. The total is 60. So we actually can't figure out what the total is because two of these rows got combined in the bottom. Um, normally, you would be able to if you split up the one and the two people families, but because they're combined for 60, we don't know how many of them have one person in their family. We don't know how many of them have two people in the family. For example, if all these 60 people have two people in the family, that would be 120. Because two times 60 is 120. But it could also be that every single one of these 60 people have just one person in their family. So one times 60 would only be 60. That's a big difference. So we don't know what the actual number is. So we can't get the average for number one. So if you look at all the choices, A is wrong because it has one Roman number one in it, and so is E. E also has Roman number one in it, so that's going to be wrong. So right off the bat, we only have three choices left. All right, so next for Roman numeral number two, the median number of members of a family of all the employees. So median number is the middle number. So the middle number here we can actually find because if you line up everything from smallest to biggest, which it kind of is lined up, uh, you have, for example, uh, five sixes. So five families have six people in their family. So that's six, 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 six. And then the next one is uh, five people, or I'm sorry, 15 people have five people in their family. So you have 15 fives, etc. Now it gets weird again when you get to the bottom row because you have 60 ones or twos, but the median is not there because you have more than 60 people here. It will compensate, it will eliminate all these 60 people. For example, the 60 people with the smallest number of people in their family will be canceled out by the time you get to the threes because five plus 15 plus 35 is uh, 55. So these 55 people will cancel out 55 people on the bottom here. And then the median will actually be uh, the three because there's 55 families with three people in their family. So the median is actually three. So we can actually figure that out. So Roman numeral number two has to be included, so choice C is wrong because it doesn't have Roman numeral number two in it. Again, we can find the median using this frequency table because it's somewhere in the middle. Yes, you don't know how many people have one or two members in their family, but all those families get eliminated because you have enough people to cancel out the 60 with these uh, people with really large families. All right, and then last but not least, the mode of the number of numbers. Uh, so here the mode is the most frequent number. And now you just look for, the because it's a frequency table, you just look at the second column. And now you see 60 is the biggest. But again, here's where that problem comes in. The 60 is actually one or two. There are 60 people with one or two people in their family. We don't know if it's 62s or 61s or some combination of both. Uh, so we actually, because 60 is actually the biggest number here, we don't know what the mode is. It could be one or two or even three. For example, if 60 people all have uh, one person in their family, uh, then, or and zero, no other people in their family, I should say, uh, then we don't, we don't know. What, what that could be. So it could be uh, zero as, as the uh, mode, or one, or even three. We, we don't really know. So that's why you can eliminate Roman numeral number three. The answer has to be choice B, two only. So the median is the only one that we can figure out. All right, and here's the summary for this page. All right, and here's the last page. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining and I will talk to you guys in the next one. All right, bye everyone.